Yes, we too have their far-reaching vision over the rainbow, if you like. We want to inspire our space community and our young generation so that they will fiercely go forward toward what might seem unreachable, so that they go on to discover and innovate, bring us exciting new ideas that will open up our universe to future initiatives. My heartfelt thanks to all of you who have come here from all over the globe to inspire us with you. We are all partners in space. We are aiming, all of us, over the rainbow. Thank you all so much. With your permission, I will continue in Hebrew. כבוד שר המדע והטכנולוגיה, כבוד ראש העיר הרצליה, ראשי סוכנויות חלל, הרצליה, heads of space agencies from around the world, ambassadors and uh, foreign delegates in Israel, astronauts, scientists, um, senior members from the industries and the civil, civil establishment uh, from the space uh, uh, industries around the world. We have delegations from 15 countries. We have commander, uh, former commander of the uh, Jordanian um, uh, Space and Air Force. Uh, we have uh, rep other representatives as well as uh, Susan Helms, uh, General Susan Helms, the astronaut, who uh, he is here again. We have a uh, delegation from the CSI from Canada, Rona and the Ramon family representatives of the Columbia Crew families, and uh, we have also excelling students from around the country, from Yerucham, Dimona, Ms. Peramon in the south, all the way to Ms. Gav in the north. We're going to have 150 students from Sderot and the Gaza perimeter communities who have suffered a lot uh, over the last two years. And of course, we also have uh, representation f of excelling students, outstanding students from our home Herzliya, our home city. There are three projects of uh, students from the Science Center in Herzliya, the Junior High School Atidim in Cholon, and the school from Misgav, as well as uh, the Religious School for Science and Technology Shapira, who won uh, the competition uh, for projects that we uh, held, and they are presenting their work at the marquee outside. Please visit, visit them. They are our future. It is a great honor for me to open the uh, eighth conference uh, named after Ilan Ramon. What we started with great trepidation eight years ago with 300 participants has become uh, an international um, conference of uh, great repute. Unfortunately, we weren't able to admit all those who wanted to participate. We had to close the registration about a week ago. However, this uh, conference has been broadcast on the internet for the whole world to uh, see and hear. You are welcome to use our computer system here. Using your smartphones, you can scan the codes outside, download the program of um, the conference as well as other con uh, con contents and communicate among themselves. This is a point where we summarize what we've done during this year. We're going to discuss innovation the importance of space to the world of uh, science, uh, technology, and industry, and uh, how it furthers all those. We also added a third day for further discussion, more thorough discussion, concerning uh, space sustainability, um, miniaturization, and new paradigms for launches. We are going to hear from uh, the representatives of the delegations who came from abroad about challenges in activity in space, international corporations, and generally the vision uh, to the future. During this time of uh, deep economic crisis, we will not be able to make any progress concerning space without vision. The American um, President Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon and do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve uh, to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, we are, not, uh, uh, we, um, uh, are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win, and the others too. This expresses the importance of the vision and the far-reaching uh, lookout of uh, leaders. We don't believe I don't believe that we are yet able to measure the contribution that space research has given us as humanity. And that's why all the uh, people who are part of uh, space research must 
adopt a certain measure of modesty. Pale blue dot is the name of the uh, photograph that was chosen already in 2001 as one of the 10 most important space photographs uh, of all times. This uh, was taken in 1990 by Voyager 1, uh, which shows planet Earth as a very small blue dot against the vast uh, space, black space. It's hard to see it, but we're a very small sp spot indeed. And if we regard ourselves with modesty, we'll know how to aspire high and reach high. Many thanks to all the sponsors, the companies, and the individuals that, who helped us um, make this uh, conference. There are many companies who uh, helped set up the marquee of exhibitions, which shows only a little bit of uh, what the space industry does in Israel and around the world. With the help of the NASA, we set up the NASA theater in the auditorium at the bottom floor, the lower floor, and I invite you to go and visit there. It's very impressive. Because of the demand, we open the third day to the general public so that they can uh, come and uh, look at the exhibitions and the uh, film and hear from astronauts, cosmonauts, and uh, scientists. We also had uh, to limit registration for that uh, day. Maybe next year we're going to have four days of conference. And to conclude, I would like to express my thanks and appreciation, which will not uh, suffice to describe the professionalism and devotion of uh, the team uh, which is composed of the Ministry of uh, Science, the ISA, uh, this uh, auditorium and uh, place, the F Fisher Institute, of course, and the uh, um, Air Force uh, home, all under uh, Avital Herling, our producer. And I would like also to thank uh, Dr. Ganit Paikovsky and Talin Bar, who are the mainstay of the academic committee of the conference. May we all have a fruitful and interesting conference. And I'm privileged now to call on the new mayor of Herzliya to uh, address us. And this is a very good opportunity to wish him great success in his new job. Mr. Yonatan Yasur. Good morning, and thank you, Asaf. Minister of uh, Science, Professor Daniel Hershkovitz, Asaf Agmon, uh, Brigadier General, uh, the head of the Fisher Institute for Strategic Studies of Air and uh, Space here in Herzliya, Menachem Kidron, Director General of the Ministry of Science, Mrs. Uh, Rona Ramon, uh, my deputy Tova Rafael, uh, who is in charge of education in Herzliya and uh, her education in Herzliya means a lot of investment in technological education. You're going to hear a little bit more about it later on. I'm very happy to be attending this uh, eighth uh, co space conference um, named after Ilan uh, Ramon. This conference has already become a uh, tradition with uh, uh, in enormous reputation. In three days' uh, time, the February 1st, we're going to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the uh, death of Ilan Ramon together with his uh, crewmates at the Columbia Space Shuttle. This tragedy has not uh, stopped space research. We still strive to obtain excellence and new visions, new horizons. We in Herzliya uh, have our own vision of fostering a new cadre of technologically uh, technologically minded young people and therefore we have uh, the educational uh, uh, tracks and we are about to launch into space a satellite made by the students in the last quarter of 2013. This nano satellite is now being built and is making good uh, progress. About 350 students are taking introductory courses to uh, space engineering and satellite engineering already in junior high school. At the end of the 10th grade, some of them join teams who are actually building the satellite and uh, their work there is considered uh, a final um, project for their matriculation uh, uh, exam purposes. 
We have 150 uh, school uh, students working under supervision of senior people from the academic world and the industrial world in Israel. This, as far as we know, is the first student satellite in the world which is going to actually be launched. And the ability of this um, science center and its uh, students to lead such a project has been recognized internationally not long ago. And one of the recognition uh, by the heads of the QB50 uh, project in Brussels who expressed their appreciation to the work done in that uh, center by the school pupils. Well, uh, in the rest of the world such work takes place in academic centers only and industrial centers alone. A little bit about this uh, science uh, center. It has eight labs, very well equipped, and uh, it can uh, conduct exper ex experiments in, uh, in electronics, uh, physics, robotics, and uh, computers. There is also a ground station which receives broadcast from, uh, or transmission from satellites that has been upgraded right now. And uh, it will be upgraded with the help of uh, uh, a similar station in Strasbourg in France. We have a lot to be proud of, however, the road is still long and it depends to a great extent on you and on conferences that you hold such as this conference. I would like to congratulate you all and thank you for your contribution to the scientific and technological arena and wish you an enjoyable and interesting conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And now I would like to call on the Minister of Science and Technology, Rabbi Professor Daniel Herskovitz. Chairman of the board, uh, Major General Herzl Bollinger, uh, Managing Director of the Fisher Brothers Institute for Air and Space Strategic Studies, Brigadier General Asaf Agmona, facilitate uh, our uh, MC here, the Mayor of Herzliya, host city, Mr. Yonatan Yasur, um, welcome and congratulations on your new uh, job. Only three uh, d weeks on the job and already hosting one of the most important conferences in the world. Uh, Director General of uh, my ministry, Mr. Menachem Rinblum. Nesim ve menahalim shil stuf New York. Distinguished guests from the international space community. I understand that uh, there is a translation, so uh, I can continue in Hebrew. Uh, anyhow, Welcome to you all. Our oh dear friend, Rona Ramon, Professor Yitzhak Ben Israel, uh, Major General uh, in reserve, the head of the ISA and the head of the National uh, Council for Research and Development, the Director General, Menachem Kidron, Distinguished guests, members, and uh, um, participants of the conference, pupils, students, distinguished guests, welcome all to the 8th Ilan Ramon Conference for Space uh, Science and Technology. This year we're commemorating the 10th year to the um, um, Columbia accident and the uh, death of Colonel Ilan Ramon and his crew members on the Columbia. This conference is, uh, has been taking place for the last eight years, together with the Fisher Institute for Strategic Studies of Air and Space and an active uh, cooperation of NASA. I'm very happy 
that uh, Charlie Bolton, the head of NASA, and his wife are uh, uh, respecting us uh, with their presence, heading a very large delegation from uh, the American Space Agency. The cooperation between uh, the uh, United States and Israel uh, agencies started in the 1980s and one of its uh, peaks was um, Ilan Ramon's uh, participation in the Columbia crew. This year we are happy to note that uh, there's a record number of delegations from around the world, 14 delegations from space agencies such as ESA, the European Space Agency, and its president, Mr. Jean-Jacques Dordan, who is here with us, as well as the space agencies of Italy and France, and the presidents, Enrico Secchese and the Minister Katskata, uh, also space agencies of Norway, Holland, Denmark, Canada, Japan, U the Ukraine, Russia, and Kazakhstan, as well as uh, the International Federation of Astronautics. We have uh, delegations of the European Commission who are also uh, responsible for the space area in the European Union and um, uh, of uh, outer space matters. We also welcome the astronauts who came here from the United States. Um, General Helms was already mentioned. Uh, the most important projects um, which uh, exemplifies what I often say that science is the language that bridges gaps between people, cultures, individuals, and uh, we have the SESAME project, a particle accelerator, not on the same scale as the, the CERN accelerator, but uh, uh, quite a respectable one located in Jordan, uh, with uh, partners uh, such as Israel. Israel is the leading partner for on the scientific side, but other partners include also Jordan, Egypt, the Palestinian Authority is also a partner, Cyprus, Kuwait, and unbelievably Iran as well. Actual cooperation, Middle Eastern cooperation, including all those countries where we don't experience any kind of tension or uh, stress whatsoever. So we appreciate all the effort and cooperation with Jordan and we hope to increase it further. We um, um, appreciate all those who made the effort to come here and uh, to participate in this conference. Um, space research as such promotes human cooperation around the globe. It's very difficult to think of any activity in space which is not international. And I'm very happy to, uh, and I'm, I'm sure, and I hope that the, this conference and the activities held during the conference will um, further this cooperation. Israel was just announced as the country which is going to host the international uh, conference for astronautics in uh, 2015, which is a huge conference, including 5,000 participants from all over the space uh, families, space industries, all those who have anything to do with uh, space. There's a very big delegation here of the Astronautics Federation participating in this conference, so I'd just like to um, note that um, the president and the prime minister took part in the efforts to bring this conference here, and we're really grateful to them all. Uh, space research is very important for the welfare of humanity. It furthers studies and research in uh, the area of ecology, uh, climate. It uh, develops te technology in telecommunications and information studies and uh, various other areas and the fields of science. And this is uh, an opportunity to try and implement various things such as one thing that seems very promising and that uh, ties in with a Nobel uh, Prize awarded to Professor Dan Schechtman who uh, was given it for the discovery of quasi um, crystals which have some interesting 
features. On the one hand, they can be very uh, light, but also very strong, 10 times as strong as steel. And there are also non-conductive metals. So these things are very useful when it comes to space especially. So in view of the importance of the space field, there's a space program which has been devised for academic institutions in Israel. Just by way of illustration, when I uh, entered my uh, role as uh, the Minister of Science and Technology as, and was um, given responsibility, among other things, for uh, the Israeli Space Agency, the annual budget of the agency was less than two million shekels. But now, and of course, uh, the Prime Minister and the President were uh, part of this effort, but now it is 180, 180 million shekels, which is a huge uh, improvement, and that helps the activity of the uh, ISA, um, allowing us to conduct major projects in space research. This is also my personal uh, opportunity in one of the um, um, events which are concluding my uh, term of office in the Ministry of Science and Technology um, to look back in great satisfaction and thank God first and foremost for the huge uh, opportunity and privilege that I had um, in promoting, being able to promote science and technology in Israel. Israel is a superpower in science and technology. However, you can always do more. And uh, this has been a great privilege indeed. Through science and technology also to develop uh, international uh, ties of our country because we are perhaps the biggest exporters of science and technology and this does have an impact on our foreign relations and especially this is uh, indeed the, the, the climax I would uh, think uh, when it comes to space studies. Um, for this I must uh, admit that uh, in this work my reward was not only the huge achievements but more than anything else the very unique kind of work that I did together with the very special team at the Science and Technology Ministry from the Director General to um, every person in the staff who are all wonderful people who always gave me the family, uh, the, the, the atmosphere of a family and always wanted to do more. And uh, also for my acquaintance with uh, the science and technology community in the whole country, in the different academic institutions and um, industry uh, projects and enterprises. And of course, uh, with the Air Force and the various space industries. And, and RONA, RONA, who is an institute all unto herself. A person who inspires us all. And um, the, that special partnership with people who came here from 14 or 15 different countries. As I said, it's very difficult to uh, think of anything done in space which is not international. However, cooperation in space starts with friendship down on Earth. And this wonderful friendship, this very uh, deep uh, camaraderie which makes all the planning and working together into a great pleasure that indeed uh, results in a wonderful experience, joint experience. So I'd like to take this opportunity and thank all the people that I had the privilege, and a great privilege it was, 
to cooperate with uh, a special thanks to the Fisher Institute and especially its tireless uh, head Asaf uh, Agmon uh, for working together uh, throughout my term of office and all the participants in this very distinguished event. I would like to wish all our guests from abroad a successful and enjoyable visit to our country and to all the participants may you enjoy this conference we have school uh, students here, uh, university students, we have researchers, scientists and in fact everything we are doing today, everything we see in space today is all yours. Space is a classical example for the power of human capital. In human capital, the capability, the desire, the wish, the vision, all that proves to us that for people, for human beings, the sky is the limit or rather there is no limit at all. So a uh, wonderful, successful and fruitful conference to us all and uh, great cooperation together afterwards. Thank you. Thank you to the Minister of Science of Technology. It was a great pleasure to work with you. The next part of the day is dedicated to the friends that we've lost. Please refrain from applause. This week holds the anniversaries of the Apollo 1 crew the Challenger STS-51L crew and the Columbia crew on its STS-107 mission. This is a week that symbolizes more than anything else the pioneers who crossed boundaries to reach new continents, new heights, the snowy poles, and new stars from different countries and different nations, men and women mobilized all their talents and knowledge with amazing daring, risking their lives to realize the unbelievable, that which is unattainable. Hundreds of millions of people from all over the globe held their breaths as they followed these pioneers and as technology advanced, their ability to be part and to feel part of the journey increased. And that is why the pain at the loss is so great. If in the skies they were angels, what they saw from there and what they know, perhaps they knew, they saw what no one knows. We were the children of the lost legend.
Thank you to Shlomit Aharon, who wrote the words to this wonderful song. Every year, the Ministry of Science and Technology gives special grants named after Ilan Ramon to students who do research in the area of speeds and to give out the grants. I have the honor of calling about the Minister of Science and Technology, Rabbi Professor Daniel Hershkovitz, the Director General of the Ministry, Mr. Menachem Greenblum, and the Director General of the Israeli Space Agency, Mr. Menachem Kidron and Rona Ramon. The Director General of the Ministry of Science and Technology will give the uh, decision of the jury.
honored minister of science and technology, Rabbi Professor Daniel Hershkovitz, Professor Bodinger, Asaf Agmon, Rona Ramon, our distinguished guests from abroad, honored participants. I will start on a personal note. I am very moved to stand here before you today. This is the fourth year where I am privileged to stand here at this conference named after an Israeli hero as the Director General of the Ministry of Science and Technology, and it is a great honor. Ilan Ramon became in his life and death a symbol for all of us. He was a trailblazer, and he taught each of us not to be afraid to dream big dreams. His path is inspiring and has taught us that even very sublime dreams can be realized. He taught us that the values that guided him were the values of leadership, true Zionism, and the love of people and land. Asaf, too, chose to take his father's path, making a personal sacrifice and realizing the ideals that he learned in this special home. The, the Ramon family home, the home of the late Ilan and of dear Rona. I am very moved further to the song that we heard here. I didn't plan this in uh, the numerical value of Ilan is the same as the numerical value of the word in Hebrew for angel and Asaf for angels. In recent years, I have been part of the consolidation of a space program with an eye to creating a space industry together with Professor Yitzhak Ben Israel, the chairman of the Israeli Space Agency. The meaning of this is, of course, the the agreement with the Treasury, which allocated 180 million shekels in two years in order to establish a civil space industry. Israel will continue to remain at the cutting edge of the space industry in order to turn all those dreams into reality. The Ministry of Science and Technology has three main space projects, the Governmental Ramon Foundation, to which seven other ministries are partner, and this is based on a governmental uh, decision to allocate a million shekels a year for each of the next 10 years. There are quizzes and competitions, grants for high school students, summer courses in the Space University, uh, a journal, and grants for students by means of other foundations. A further program of the ministry is the establishment of a space center, and in this context, two centers have been established. Yes, two. One for the Druze population in Yarka, and the second one for the Arab population in Taibe all named after Ilan Ramon. The Ilan Ramon Scholarship Program is a prestigious doctoral prog program for PhD and, and postdoctoral students at uh, the sum of 250,000 shekels. At the first conference when I participated in 2010, Dalia Dobovin and Leonan Mazal earned a grant of 250,000 shekels each. We spoke with them before the conference to see what they are doing today. It turns out that both are at the advanced stages of their PhD and they expressed their extreme gratitude for the grant that they they received from the ministry, which enabled them to complete their research for their PhDs in the best way possible. They also promised to contribute to the teaching of science to young people and to continue ties with the Ministry of Science. I wish you all an interesting and enriching day. Thank you.
The Ministry of Science and Technology commemorates the memory of the first Israeli the first Israeli astronaut, Colonel Ilan Ramon, through the uh, distribution of grants for students who are studying in uh, institutions of higher education in Israel. The Ramon Scholarship is a prestigious one intended for students working on their doctorates or postdoctorates. And uh, each year, two grants are given to uh, doctorate students of 250,000 uh, shekels and one of 200,000 for a postdoctoral student. This year, two students won the, these prestigious uh, scholarships. I would like to call upon Alona Vazan Shukron to receive a certificate from the Ministry of Science and Technology, Alona. Alona Vazan Shukron is a PhD candidate at Tel Aviv University. Her dissertation is on the development of giant planets. This dissertation is an academic one and involves calculations of the transportation of masses uh, outside the solar system and is aimed at increasing our knowledge of the development of giant planets in the solar system and outside it. In the past uh, decade, this has been a very important subject in the international community. The uh, dissertation is being written under the supervision of Professor Podolak and Professor Kovac of the uh, Department of Physics and Planetary Science Geophysics at uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, Alona Vazan Shukron did her BA at the Technion in Haifa and her MA in Tel Aviv University. Now I have the honor of calling upon the second recipient of this year's Ramon Scholarship uh, to receive Israel Silver to receive his doctorate technology. and award certificate from the Israel, ministry. Israel. Mar Israel Silver is a graduate of Tel Aviv University and a student of the direct PhD track in Tel Aviv University. His research is about long-term and short-term changes in the upper atmosphere. It is an experimental study intended to combine measurable results from a number of instruments in order to study and understand the impact of climatic phenomena on Earth and in space on the upper atmosphere, which affects the progress of radio waves through the atmosphere and satellite orbits. The study is being conducted under the supervision of Professor Colin Price from the Department of Geophysics and Atmospheric and Planetary Studies at Tel Aviv University. Israel Silver completed his degree with honors and his BA with honors and his grades for his MA guaranteed his entrance into the direct PhD track. Thank you. And now I would like to call upon Alana Vazan Vazan Shukrun to say a few words on behalf of the grantees. Honored Minister of Science and Technology, Rabbi Professor Daniel Hershkovitz, the head of the Fisher Institute, General Asaf Agmon, Mr. Menachem Greenblum, the Director of the Ministry, Mr. Menachem Kidron, the Deputy Director of the Israel Space Agency, Rona Ramon, dear guests, on behalf of Israel Silver and myself, I would like to express my gratitude to the 
העומד בראשו, הרב פרופסור דניאל הרשקוביץ, על קבלת המלגה על שם אילן רמון בשנת 2013. לחקר תחום החלל משמעות עצומה בעינינו, הן כחוקרים צעירים והן כישראלים. החלל טומן בחובו הזדמנויות רבות. טכנולוגיות, ביטחוניות ומדעיות כאחד. כדוקטורנטים בחוג לגיאופיזיקה ומדעים אטמוספריים ופלנטריים באוניברסיטת תל אביב, נפלה בחלקנו הזכות לקחת חלק במחקרים מרתקים בתחומי הבנת העולמות החדשים הנחשפים ביבוא ובסביבה בענו חיים. מלגה זו, המנציחה את מורשתו של אילן רמון לחדשנות ומצוינות, מסייעת בעידוד חקר החלל והיקום בקרב אקדמאים צעירים במדינת ישראל. אנו מוקירים את ההשקעה של משרד המדע והטכנולוגיה בתחום חקר מדעי החלל ומודים על הבעת האמון בחשיבות המחקרים שלנו והתמיכה החיונית בחקרים. תודה רבה. Good day to everyone, dear guests from all over the world, dear friends who have come a long way with me oh. in different ways. Dear Asaf, congratulations for the outstanding organization of such a distinguished conference that is so impressive and indeed I have two gentlemen standing next to me whom I have come to know in the past uh, period, relatively past period, when I look at the past 10 years. I, I'll, I'll leave you here standing next to me if you don't mind. I hope it's okay. Ten years have passed, and this morning on the way here, I was asked in an interview on an American uh, station, how, I, uh, how am I? And it's been 10 years since that question has been a very complex one for me. But today I can say to you that I am proud. 10 years after when the number is so round and the period is so long and at the same time so, so short, after so many upheavals in our private lives that you are all aware of, I can say that this morning and this whole week, in fact, I am proud. Uh, they asked me another question today, and I'm surprised when I hear good questions. I've heard it from a number of other people. When there's a good question, you remember it. I was also asked, what, what is the legacy of Ilan? And the first thing that sprang to mind was his smile. And his smile is, in my view, his greatest legacy. A few moments ago, we saw those, the, the big smiles of the scholarship grantees when they were received the scholarship, and I immediately looked at our faces, what they do to us, and the smile is immediately contagious. So 10 years later, I am proud because we have managed together with friends and partners to reach circles of influence and inspiration of education and legacy. Ten years later, we are touching on the international arena, both at this important conference as well as at 
אנשי הצוות. וכך הוא בא, שרשרת של חברות אסטרטגיות בעולם, והם נקראים לכם 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 before the whole world. So that is the international aspect that we indeed have to be proud of. On the national level, I am happy to say that another check on the list has been checked, and that is the wonderful cooperation with the Parks and Nature Authority. If you look at these wonderful two people who have managed to put into effect the Ramon Foundation, and we're about to open a new center, the Ramon Center, which will include the study of the skies and earth, which will tell the story of Elan and the Columbia crew. So on the national level, we have a great deal to be proud of. But more than anything else, I am proud of the personal aspect, those small changes that we are able to make among the young people, among the wonderful scholarship grantees who receive the scholarships and have life-changing experiences. So on the personal level, we also have reason to be proud, both of our state and I can say in my home as well. We are proud of the path. We are proud of how we are contending. And that is what we want to share and to continue and to expand throughout all of Israeli society and further. Space creates a challenging environment in many ways. Yesterday I saw a film of my friend Garrett about the SpaceX when they are sending the grasshopper. If I may, there is an experiment. He can explain it better than me, of course. But when you hear the cries of joy of those researchers, of those scientists who work so hard and so long on the same project, and we've heard this many times at this conference, those cries of joy at the success, so that smile and those cries uh, that touches all ages, and it's a wonderful thing. And to conclude, I would like to close my own personal list with two further check marks. One is the subject of the diaries, Ilan and Asaf's diaries. They say on the bucket list, you have to write a book. Think about it. So, in these 10 years, I wrote a research project in the context of my studies, but I also managed to publish two books, two special books that speak Ilan's language and another book that speaks Ilan and Asaf's words. Those two, these two dear gentlemen standing next to me, I've gone through a lot of ministers in the past 10 years. Rabbi, professor, minister, my dear friend Daniel Hershkowitz, thank you for your support. It has been a pleasure to take this path together with you. And on my right here is our wonderful people. And Menachem, I have no words for the support and the path, and I'm sure that this friendship will continue. So the new book of diaries, you can all see it and read it, the diary which survived from space, that unique diary that for me was proof that miracles do happen. I'd like to show the book to the audience. 
The diary of Elan, the last diary he wrote in space, survived, as you know. And because I wanted to make it something that we could hold in our hands, we made a true copy of this diary. And this special copy is given to people, special people in my life, people who have trod this special path with me and at this opportunity I would like to, to say politics could look different with you on the map forgive me for a political statement statement but really I have a great deal of appreciation and admiration for all your help and everything that you have done And once again, to Menachem, I'm sure that we will march together again. Thank you to everyone. And I wish us all three successful, enjoyable, and enriching days. And Let's not forget that this is the place that makes us smile. Once again, Asaf, Fisher Institute, my Canadian friends, thank you very much. And we'll carry on. Thank you to Rona. Like every year, the president, President Shimon Peres, greets the, the conference. Today, without space, or without satellites, the world appears impossible. It's bizarre how things have changed. Without GPS technology, we're blind. Without the ability to overcome gravity, we would look miserable and limited. Without tel the telecommunications, which uses space, which is drawn by the satellites, we would again be foreigners and distant from one another. Without spaceships, it would be difficult to run the world. The telephony, the telecommunications, telenavigations, even agriculture, and certainly self-defense. This has made us, from people who thought there was only a world to people who now know that there are worlds, and in those worlds there are things that we don't have in our world. It's not only a breakthrough, it is a breakthrough to new opportunities, and we are only at the beginning. Israel has no other compensation for its small size other than the breadth of space. There, we're like everyone else. We leave behind our boots on the ground and grow wings into that broad expanse. Israel has made space industry into a central uh, major industry. We have over 20 companies. This is the industry of the future. This space brings people close together and cuts short distances. Space is not afraid of limitations and it becomes a hope, a great new hope. It, each of you has contributed a great deal to this industry and each of you carries an even greater dream regarding the potential of this industry. We thank you very much for constantly encouraging us and helping us. I would like to thank you that you have chosen Israel as the place of your next conference in 2015. And I am proud 
that we will be hosting it. I would like to wish you all a successful conference and continue to contribute to humanity with courage and daring and innovation. Thank you, President. Um, man of vision and a tireless supporter of uh, science and uh, space technology. Looking back, um, now we would like—I would like to uh, call upon Mr. Sean O'Keefe, who was uh, the commander at the time of the uh, Columbia mission. Um, Eitan Ben Eliyahu, who was uh, the uh, commander of the Air Force at the time and the one who chose Ilan to uh, uh, the uh, role of the first astronaut in space, Mr. Abi R. Evan of, um, and Lieutenant Colonel Rezev Moalem, who was former director of the Israeli Astronaut Project in the IAF. Uh, please. Ethan, with your permission, I would like uh, to ask you first, from your own point of view, as the commander of the Air Force, how uh, was this idea of um, sending an Israeli astronaut, uh, how was it born? Well, first of all, I would like to note that Israeli activity in space started in the 1980s. The uh, ISA was established and the first satellite was launched, OFAC-1, and uh, the university started uh, going into space uh, research. So the first signs were the late 1970s, early 1980s. So in the Air Force, uh, there was a need at the time to have some presence in space because some uh, very remote threats became uh, manifest and we needed to uh, be able to control um, bigger areas, larger than before, not just the Golan Heights or the Sinai, for example. And therefore, uh, we uh, saw this need as, as uh, uh, an increasing need, uh, more or less around the time when I became the commander of the um, Air Force. Now, in 1995, uh, there was a tragedy of uh, the murder of the Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. And shortly afterwards, in December 1995, the um, then Prime Minister and now President, Mr. Shimon Peres, was invited to Washington. He was uh, invited uh, to come on a, a working visit and a, a friendship visit by President Clinton. And they were discussing the continued cooperation between the U.S. and Israel. As uh, a side remark on one of the uh, social visits that took place uh, at that time, uh, the uh, president uh, proposed that an Israeli astronaut would join a space mission, just like other countries uh, were invited by the U.S. to do so. There were many things on our hands at the time, uh, many troubles. It was right after the murder of Pre Prime Minister Rabin, and uh, Mr. Perez came back, and uh, there was elections. But when I was appointed in 1996, the commander of the Air Force, I remembered that uh, short remark. And together with the then uh, Chief of General Staff, Mr. Amron Lipkin Shachak, I asked permission to go ahead with it. And I was uh, invited to the United States and uh, met the uh, uh, Dan Golding, the, who was then the head of the space agency. 
and asked him to um, take this uh, request and uh, start working on it, and he uh, agreed instantly. Uh, and from then it started taking off. And of course, we had to uh, find the right person and uh, authorize them to go on that mission. And we uh, made that as part of our annual uh, discussions of um, uh, placing officers in different places in the Air Force. And Elon was uh, found to be the right person for the job, a, a technological person, a, uh, an engineer and a pilot as well. And he was actually about to retire. He was about to retire from the Air Force, so he was uh, available. We appointed him. It was 1997. In the summer 97, we appointed him during our placement discussions. And it took a year until he finally uh, went out there in 1998. During that time, he was preparing for that kind of uh, sortie. He uh, was my, um, he, he had been my assistant uh, for special missions in the Air Force. And uh, he uh, went off and we uh, got immediate cooperation from the ISA, Abi Arevan uh, at the time was the person cooperating with us, and Itzik Ben Israel, who was um, then the head of uh, MAFAT, um, the uh, Development Administration, was uh, the person who connected between the needs of the Air Force and the development and technology needs. And we hooked together with the universities and the industry, and everybody got together around it. So for five years, we had an astronaut, the first two, who were training at NASA. What did he do to the Air Force? Well, I only uh, mentioned the operational uh, reason, but there were other reasons as well. First of all, we uh, felt that it was very important to give a push to technological education in Israel. And we felt that perhaps, we thought that perhaps this uh, um, is something that can uh, encourage youngsters and, and make them enthusiastic about uh, about it. We also started a new branch. At first, it was a section within the Air Force uh, to do with space. And uh, we were sure, we were certain, and I'm, I'm glad that now, looking back, I mean, you could have seen it right afterwards, that this visibility, this high visibility of space uh, introduced it into people's awareness and consciousness and, and uh, the agenda of universities, industry, the military, and within the Air Force especially, that it would uh, pull this entire group, this entire community forward. And this is indeed what happened. There were some tactical political issues there, there, there as well. We have started tinkering with space some time before, as I said, and uh, within this uh, huge security mechanism that we have, different mechanism that we have, every organization wants to have the uh, output, or, or, but they don't want to have to carry the budget for it and to, to carry the budget overloads for it. And that's why the Air Force somehow stayed outside of it a little bit at first in order not to carry the budgetary burden. However, when it uh, uh, became obvious that we uh, were going to have some intensive activity to do with uh, space, then we introduced it into the Air Force and from, uh, and, and the rest is history, basically. Avi, can you perhaps tell us about the process that took place from the moment a decision was taken to send an uh, uh, Israeli astronaut to NASA? NASA is a, a civilian organization, whereas the Air Force is a military one, and there's the ISA, the Ministry of Defense, and the uh, Ministry of the Science. How do they cooperate? When I uh, entered my office in 95, I met uh, Mr. Dan Goldman, then the head of NASA, and uh, there was a question about it indeed, but it was obvious to both of us that uh, because of the budgetary requirements, it didn't seem feasible at the time. However, uh, when later in 95, our own president of today met with President Clinton, we were very surprised to see this uh, televised interview where they uh, 
both and as they decided or when, when they were both uh, deciding to send an Israeli astronaut on an NASA mission. Following that, I received uh, many calls from some very special people, mostly from the Air Force, from the reserves, from the uh, 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 the commander and others, people who were willing to become astronauts, but nothing happened until Eitan, the then Air Force uh, commander, um, put his weight in, and uh, whenever he takes something into his hands, it usually starts rolling. So following that, uh, there were many meetings, and we started looking for uh, available budgets. We found uh, with all kinds of people, such as Isaac, Isaac Ben Israel, who together with Uzi Ilan uh, mobilized uh, themselves, and Eitan uh, picked Ilan, which was a fantastic uh, choice indeed. As we all know, shortly afterwards, we were required to appoint another person as backup. And once again, Ilan picked a wonderful person, Yitzhak Mayo, a pilot and navigator. And uh, we started looking for an experiment because uh, it wasn't easy. There were many suggestions uh, from the academic uh, world, such as uh, mice with electrodes, and Elon would have to take care of them. Uh, we thought maybe we'd need the green card for them as well. So we decided uh, to uh, uh, forego that idea, and there were other ideas as well. Uh, all kinds of suggestions that were going to benefit uh, humanity, unlike a Syrian astronaut or cosmonaut who at the time uh, flew on a Russian shuttle and uh, he was just a tourist at the time, but here uh, when it was a matter of cooperating with NASA, we wanted to find an experiment that would be beneficial and in Tel Aviv University we found a few uh, scientists such as Professor Zev Levin and uh, Yosef Yoyachin, uh, may rest in peace, and several other uh, great people from the Tel Aviv uh, University. And uh, uh, they offer this um, experiment that could explain the migration of dust. It's a problem that we are aware of every March and April. And helped by uh, Eitan, who gave us uh, uh, who introduced us to um, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Mayor Moalem, whom you'll soon hear from, is sitting right here next to me. Uh, we got some budgets from the Ministry of Science, also uh, took part in a very serious way, and we sent our two candidates to the U.S., and they passed the um, interest exams, including a claustrophobic uh, test, claustro claustrophobia test. They um, put them in a uh, sealed uh, bag it, for 11 minutes, and it seemed like eternity, as Mayo told us. And uh, they were uh, appointed to be a mission specialists. Dan Golding uh, helped us, though, when they were uh, given excellent training. There were many uh, postponements until they finally went out to space. The experiment was very successful since the phenomenon of dust is something that can either happen or not happen. We were looking for another uh, topic as backup, uh, and it, it is still being studied around the world. There are, cer there, there are certain flashes at the height of 100 kilometers called sprites, and uh, we got there with a delegation of some 200 uh, Israelis, Mr. O'Keefe uh, was in charge at the time and there was excellent cooperation with him. And the experiment was underway. Unfortunately, it ended the way it uh, did on that February 1st when Eitan was one of the channels and I was on another channel and uh, we just saw it happening before our eyes. Abi, how did you try and leverage the uh, first participation of an Israeli astronaut uh, in uh, promoting technological education in Israel. Well, this is, I think, one of the greatest achievements 
of this experiment. The topic of space is one of the, the topics that uh, caused the greatest enthusiasm among youngsters. You can see children as young as six and seven who already play and, and talk about space and they have wonderful imagination and together with them. Ilan and Eitan and anyone who had anything to do with this experiment, we decided at the time that one of the lessons would be educating the Israeli population. We were thinking mainly about uh, the uh, uh, teenagers and youngsters at the time. We were not thinking so much about uh, the um, Air Force, but we uh, wanted to raise an infrastructure of uh, youth who were science-oriented, because Edwin said to me, out of a hundred kids who are enthusiastic about this, and it is an exciting uh, subject after all, we see until today, every astronaut who goes out, how many children, children are so enthusiastic. If out of uh, a every hundred children, uh, two or, or three children will go into science and, and not into uh, startup uh, companies. Today we all know that without technology, without science, as the president has said, our lives would have uh, been completely different. So that would be a tremendous achievement. And indeed there was a wave of enthusiasm and interest about space which uh, swept all over the country and uh, uh, the, uh, all over the youngsters in this country. It's true that not all of them are going to become astronauts and, and will not all uh, actually go and uh, become scientists when they grow up, but it's very important that they're enthusiastic about it. One of the schools chosen to uh, go into it uh, was uh, Old Kiat Motskin, uh, who participated in the experiment in space. To this day, they are one of the uh, national leaders in uh, uh, the science, and it also represented us in the uh, first in competition in the U.S. <coughs> Mayor, what, is, what was your role in it? I, uh, at the time, was a young pilot and I just uh, finished my studies and I uh, got my first staff job. And I got this uh, note, five uh, lines about the decision of the Air Force commander to start uh, an Israeli space science project. And they said, good luck to you. Well, right uh, now, everybody knows already that it uh, was a very important project and contributed a lot. However, at the time, it wasn't as simple as that. Uh, the Air Force is a fighting uh, organization and conducting uh, pure academic research in space on top of it, with NASA on top of that, is not something that exactly in the, the core business of the uh, IAF. And indeed, the heads of the IAF at the time had a vision. Today we see it being implemented already. But at the time, it wasn't that simple. I don't know if Aitan remembers, but the first time we introduced the project to him, in fact, he commanded me, he ordered me to do everything in my power for this project to succeed, just as if we were uh, developing uh, a new UAV or a new missile for the IAF. And this is what we tried to do. I would divide this uh, project into three, or rather, not uh, uh, rather four parts. The first part was the study, uh, the, the learning curve, the learning time. Uh, Professor Ravid, Professor Yosef, who were mentioned here already, and also Professor Yair, who was the coordinator of the project. It took us about a year together to actually study and learn how to work with NASA and what we were required to do. During our first uh, visit there, Tom Dixon, the head of the Hitchhiker uh, Project, who was working with us, um, uh, said to us, look, this is about the height of the paperwork that you'll have to go through until you finally get an experiment aboard the space shuttle. And it wasn't uh, very far from the truth. So during that year, we were learning the mentality, the language, all the acronyms, and we chose a company who would do the integration with the space shuttle uh, for us, uh, Mobile Sciences, 
uh, from the US and uh, we uh, wanted very much uh, for those who would build the camera and build the experiment would be the Israeli space industry. We tried to do that, however, uh, it was not successful for all kinds of reasons. Then we went into the second phase where we were actually dealing with the real stuff, building the camera and the experiments and all the checklists and uh, preparing uh, the uh, shuttle uh, crew. And this is, this is very important. This is a very important stage. Until you have your crew that goes on the shuttle, you don't really know where you stand. There wasn't a date yet. You have all kinds of people in NASA that you work with, but it's nothing is very focused. Once there's a crew and there's a commander, then there's a very clear address, a very clear addressee, and then someone who's in charge of the whole thing and has the responsibility, and you can work with them. Um, fortunately for us, uh, even during the first meeting with uh, the wonderful crew, when we presented Madex, the experiment uh, uh, to them, we saw that there was great excitement about it uh, by all the astronauts. And if, if up until then, the intention was that Ilan uh, on his shift uh, will uh, operate the experiment ever so often, and uh, on the uh, uh, other shift, then uh, we would have to do most of it from the ground with some cooperation. But that enthusiasm by the astronauts themselves actually um, resulted in the fact that six out of the seven astronauts became very active in Maydex and they operated our experiment and they also uh, arrived at the astronaut training and uh, really gave us a big push. Another thing I want to mention is the importance of the good science. Um, to NASA's credit, I would say that the only uh, consideration that they had in uh, giving preferences and communication to the ground, etc., was a scientific one. If we were able to show that in order to get better science out of the experiment, we needed a certain resource or something sp special, then we're given it by NASA. As you said, when the Columbia crew visited uh, Israel in 2000 in order to train for the experiment, that was a very exciting time following which six of the astronauts wanted to be part of the experiment. Can you tell us about any other event that took place uh, during their meeting with the academic staff? Yes. I remember in one of the evenings we went out to a restaurant not far from here, uh, around Herzliya, and we were sitting there eating, drinking, uh, uh, raising toast. And Professor uh, Kam uh, wanted to make a toast, and he started uh, um, with this speech. I, I hadn't known that he was a Holocaust survivor from Bergen-Belsen, and he started speaking in a trembling voice, saying how proud he was for being, as a child who came out of Bergen-Belsen, was about to send out into space an Israeli experiment with an Israeli astronaut aboard a space shuttle. It was a, a very touching moment, and I think for Professor Yosef, uh, who um, hadn't told us about his past up until then, there was a special moment, and a special um, connection appeared between him and Ilan. Later on, he was the one who gave to Ilan that uh, Torah scroll that we all uh, know uh, which survived the uh, Holocaust and uh, got uh, to space and uh, during the, flight sp fl uh, the space flight, Ilan told uh, the story of that Torah scroll during a, a press conference. So uh, what happened with the experiment eventually? Well, we were able to uh, receive the right resources from NASA so that uh, the data would be um, transmitted to Earth in real time and uh, much of the data indeed uh, arrived. We had two uh, purposes, two goals, to look at dust storms around the Mediterranean. One of the unique things about Medix was that during the dust storm, we uh, were flying a special uh, plane with all kinds of instruments that was sampling the particles, thereby allowing us to get a true radiometric measurement from space and also analyze other data. And this is what we were able to do during the mission. We measured dust storms in the Atlantic uh, Ocean with other satellites, NASA satellites. We also measured uh, partial storm uh, 
uh, of the, the Israeli coastline. We also measured sprites, as uh, Avi mentioned. Already on the first day, we were able to uh, take photos of such uh, uh, sprite from space, and then later on there was a flood of such data. Those uh, data were processed, of course, and analyzed after the flight in uh, Tel Aviv. University researchers published extensively on that. We have doctoral students, postdoc students. Some of them went to NASA for continue to continue their studies. And uh, the scientific value of MADEX, which is not so well known to the public, is quite significant. So you're saying a large portion of the data uh, survived? Yes, definitely. And to this day, we still find new things to uh, go further into. Uh, during the preparation, May said that uh, parts of the uh, MADEX instrumentation came, arrived in Israel, and I would like uh, to uh, use some um, Israeli uh, cheek and uh, ask uh, Mr. Bolden, you know, perhaps you can do, if you can do all in your power so that next year we will be able to um, put some of uh, the remnants of the MADEX, some of the uh, debris that remain from the MADEX uh, in our marquee here, our exhibition marquee here for the youngsters, for our youngsters to show. We would really appreciate if it could happen next year. Thank you. Bershav Lamar O'Keefe. I would like to ask you. What is the challenges, as you see it, of having a non-American team member in such a complicated and uh, challenging uh, project? I could not hear it. I'm sorry. You don't need the earphone. Oh, yeah. I, I will repeat. I would like to ask you, what is the challenges, what are the challenges, as you see it, to have a non-American team member in a such complicated and challenging uh, project? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, I want to commend you for tasking my successor immediately with an Thank opportunity you. for an extension of an experiment. Good luck, Charlie. That's a <laughs> good task. Um, I think you know, the, the challenges, frankly, are, are really have been uh, conquered over the course of uh, 10 years of tremendous success, more now a dozen years, of tremendous success of operating the International Space Station 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, 12 months out of the year, continuously during that time with no interruption, with crews from all international backgrounds uh, having been represented and aboard the space shuttle for years before that, of seeing the wide range of international cooperation uh, the, the challenges have largely been conquered. Those challenges of language, those challenges of metrics, those challenges of, of understanding of how the, the uh, experiments have application in any specific uh, national interest or global one, uh, have, have been really reconciled in a way that requires mounds of paperwork, as previously described. Uh, but that's to, to get everyone on exactly the same position. Of, of understanding what the objectives are and then accomplishing those tasks. Um, I, I point again to the International Space Station as a tremendous example of how that cooperation, cooperation has come together. This is the functional equivalent of the eighth wonder of the world, having constructed something that's the size of two football fields in space from many different nations, lots of different backgrounds, lots of different engineering challenges, and yet the tolerance for any error is zero. When it gets there, it has to fit, and it did. Over the course of that time, that is a good example of an achievement of how international cooperation has been made to work, and frankly, um, really undervalued by the, by the, uh, the national uh, and international press as really the amazing achievement that it is of exactly the point of your question. Thank you. Looking back, do you think that NASA and all of us have learned the right lessons from the STS-107 tragedy? That's a profoundly good question. Um, and it's almost impossible to answer. Because this is, in its very nature, exploration is the business and the, the enterprise of discovery of learning more about what it is you think you know and then learning things that you never would have imagined you could know. 
every step in this process uh, of exploration that humans have endeavored to do over the course of our experience as humans on this planet has been marked by tremendous triumphs and tremendous tragedies every single step of the way. And from those, we learn from both. I think in this particular case, it was a profound lesson. It was one that reminds us of our own frailty, of our own challenges of logic, of what it is we think we know is a certainty, and then reminding ourselves we need to go back and demonstrate that, test it, be sure that we understand all those dimensions of what we thought we knew as a fact. And so we relearn some things, unfortunately, generation after generation, and this is certainly one of those instances. There was nothing profound in, in the observations of an exhaustive investigation. It was more that there were so many things we failed to do precisely right. And the risk in this endeavor is enormous. The returns are also enormous, as in any exploration venture. Uh, so what we've learned, I think, from the experience is something we see in evidence every day. We see a much greater technology being uh, pressed to its limit in every exploration conquest objective we've been after. Uh, and in doing so, that has posed significant challenges where we must continually remind ourselves of lessons that come from the entire experience of the Columbia mission. Having been in the center of uh, this uh, painful experience, uh, what is your, uh, your vision regarding the human space exploration? I think my vision is the same as that of every other human being. We all have an innate desire to want to know. We absolutely have a curiosity about that which we don't know. And my only, I think, uh, uh, aspect to emphasize on that same characteristic we all share as human beings is to yield to it. Go do it. What we learn again from Columbia was the tremendous challenge of find out exactly what the problems were, go correct them, and then go rededicate ourselves to the very objectives they were after, of discovery, of understanding, and exploration. And that is a human desire that we all have. And the only atonement would be to yield to it. Thank you very much for your candid words. I would like to conclude, Eitan, with a question to you. For us, Colombia and Ilan are a very personal matter. What are the personal things that you gave Ilan to take with him to space? First of all, when you are the commander of the Air Force, uh, you only work directly with the people that are directly under you. But what happened was that I did work with Elon for a year and a half before he set out. I was in very close contact with him during the entire time he was there. And there's another small point that the flight was, or the launch was uh, delayed uh, again and again and again. And we found all kinds of ways not to bring him back. We found another budget the budget that we used so that the family could remain abroad was uh, from the student quotas that the Air Force could send abroad. So we, could, we said that could be considered studies, and we used that. And we were afraid that if we brought him back to Israel with all the delays and all the mishaps and there were other uh, um, candidates, we thought it would all go down the drain. So we insisted on leaving him there. So, of course, over the years, personal relationships were forged, and Elon appreciated the fact that he'd been chosen very much. And I think there is no argument that he was indeed the best choice. He was the right person in the right place, the most suitable, not only professionally, but also because of the inspiration that he gave all those who followed that mission.
And as we heard, Elon was allowed to take a number of items with him into space. And he called me and he said, look, Eitan, I have a quota of a number of items I can take into space, and I'd like to ask you to invite you to choose something that you would like me to take with me to space. And I chose the wings that I had been wearing since flight training and two pictures of my children. I cast them into a kind of a plastic or perspex cube, uh, about 10 centimeters, and I put it in a, an envelope and I sent it to him. And indeed, that, he took that into space. And after what happened, a few months later, Rona called me and asked me to come over. We met in Tel Aviv, and she said to me, look, from all the debris of the Columbia, we found a number of things, and some of them uh, had national uh, importance, and they were made public by Rona. But there was a, this piece of plastic, this piece of perspex with your wings and the pictures of your children cast inside them was found. And we thought that you should have it back. And we wanted to give it to you personally. I was very moved. I received the, this, the gift. And, the, uh, and later, when I served as the chairman of the Science Museum in um, Haifa, which added on the aspect of space. I gave it to the museum, and it's there in the permanent exhibition as part of the space exhibition in the Science Museum of Haifa. Uh, that's just a small example of how personally we are all involved in the Columbia. Thank you to everyone. And if we're continuing on a personal note, so Dr. John Clark was the crew doctor six, six times on shuttles. He served as the head of operational medicine and the chief doctor of the IFA in Johnson Space Center. And before serving in NASA, he served for 26 years in the U.S. Navy. And the height of his military career, he attributes to his service in Desert storm and uh, his service with the Marines. John, who John is the husband of Aurel Clark, an astronaut, and he shared his thoughts with us after the loss. He will share his thoughts of us after the loss of the Columbia. And this is not the first time John is here at this conference. It's quite an honor to be back in Israel. I want to thank the Ministry of Science and Technology and the Department of Science and Technology and the Department of Science and Technology. This is going to be a little bit of a more personal talk. Quite honestly, I can't fathom it. I have a privilege of being a member of the Columbia. כאשר הוא הגיע לראשונה למרכז ג'ונסון, ואני זוכר שאמרתי לאשתי כעבור כמה אה, ימים שגם לישראלים יהיה אסטרונאוט. זה היה עוד לפני שקבעו מי יהיה בצוות, ולאחר מכן גם היא נקבעה, ולאחר מכן בחרו את המפקד והטייס, וכפי שהזכרנו, היו הרבה עיכובים 
וכאשר אני מסתכל לאחור, זה בעצם היה מצוין, משום שכולם זכו להכיר זה את זה, והמשפחות זכו לבלות זמן ביחד, וכאשר המשימה סוף סוף נקבעה ב-2003, אנשים אמרו, אולי אפשר לדחות עוד קצת, כי אנחנו ממש נהנים ביחד. אז מה שאני אדבר עליו זה... משהו שקשור לבטיחות בחלל, ועם זה אני אתקדם. הנה תמונת צוות הקולומביה, הם לובשים למעשה חליפות הישרדות, זאת חליפה שיש לה מצנח ובקבוקים והיא מתאימה ל... אנחנו <laughs> And th this is a picture of Laurel uh, with, uh, with, with Rona on the uh, launch pad. They get to do a pad tour. And they, you can just see the love in their eyes and their smiles. Part of the training uh, the families get to get involved with, and it's, uh, it's interesting because uh, this, was, uh, this was part of the escape system that they're wearing, and that was the one, t one of the times we got to spend Uh, with with the the crew and here's uh, our son Ian with uh, his mom uh, looking at some of the pictures and procedures that they have to do and they actually train uh, for escaping from the shuttle and I'll talk a little bit about that now I was a flight surgeon in the Navy uh, for many years and I was a military high altitude uh, freefall parachutist And, and Laurel was a parachutist too. She had 25 parachute jumps. So parachuting was something that was in our blood. And, and I'm proud to say Ian, when he turned 18, did uh, three parachute jumps as well. So parachuting is in our family. The last day I worked in mission control at NASA was 25 January. I worked a relief shift for 107. And uh, it was exactly one week before they were to land. And I remember going through the notes from all the the summary logbooks, um, that they had had this issue about this debris strike. And I had this debate about whether I should tell Laurel about it because I know there was some discussion with the pilot and commander, but I don't know that the other crew members necessarily had insight into the, the damage that turned out to be a, a fatal uh, damage to the left wing. But I held myself responsible afterwards because I knew and I didn't do anything. And so I... I vowed that I was going to follow through with trying to enhance uh, safety in space. And I would try to apply some of the knowledge I had about uh, bailout and parachuting. The uh, Columbia Accident Investigation Board, or the, also called the CABE, um, uh, completed their report in, in October of 2003. And there was a small section, a very small section in there that dealt with crew survival. It was from this group called the Crew Survival Working Group. And NASA th thought, you know, this is really sensitive. We don't want that to be put in. And the families got together, and we sent a note to the Columbia Board and said, we want that part of the report to remain in the Columbia Investigation Report. And these are some of the comments that were sent in an email to Admiral Hal Gaiman, who was the chairman of the Columbia Board. The Columbia spouses are all unified in our desire to ensure that lessons learned from this mishap be applied to prevent this type of accident from happening again. These were direct, uh, uh, directly from that email. A fundamental aspect of every aerospace mishap investigation is the understanding of crew survivability issues, and there is still much to learn about survival during upper atmospheric reentry. And then It is essential for these effects related to crew survival to be disseminated to ensure the next generation of spacecraft are afforded the maximum protection. And it is such a wonderful legacy that the Columbia crew's sacrifice will be towards the next generation of spacecraft, both commercial and the, the NASA spacecraft. 
And that was the closing sentence in that email. The greatest legacy of the Columbia crew will be these enduring lessons applied to future, future space human endeavors. And so with that, um, in 2004, NASA formed a group called the S S Spacecraft Crew Survival Integrated Investigation Team. We also called ourselves the C Columbia Survival Investigation Team. And we spent three years of field work, including uh, three weeks in the um, debris section that uh, where the Columbia debris, debris now is currently housed at uh, Kennedy Space Center in the vertical assembly building. And also going through the autopsy material, site visits, um, and one of the things that I, as a, as a person very um, uh, concerned about not learning lessons from history, is I went back and reviewed all these mishaps that occurred, and some of them were space mishaps, like Soyuz 11 and the Challenger mishap and, and the X-15 mishap, which was actually the first U.S. mishap. But others were related to the prelude to space that was the stratospheric balloon program. And so I went back and studied all these things, and it turns out that that became very important in a follow-on project that I'll tell you about shortly. This is a picture of me with uh, Greg Kovacs, uh, who is also on the Columbia board. Uh, this was the first time we looked at the heads-up display, the uh, hand controllers. We put together a lot of the Columbia wreckage that had never actually been uh, reassembled and, and analyzed, and we were able to tell quite a bit of interesting things, not the least of which was that the crew knew that there were, the vehicle was in danger and they were activating the restart of the auxiliary power units as part of that loss of control um, procedure. The Columbia Board report came out in 2008, and here's a copy of it. It's available electronically, and if somebody wants a copy, I'd be happy to send them the link or the actual copy. In 2009, I wrote a report in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society, which was a summary of my, uh, my uh, um, thoughts on the Columbia um, mishap and the crew survival lessons learned. And then that year, very shortly thereafter, I joined the team uh, that was going to do uh, stratospheric jumps from balloons. One of the things that came out of the, 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 uh, the Columbia Survival Investigation Team was that the vehicle breakup occurred at an altitude that actually was far lower than we had thought. Originally, the vehicle was thought to have broken up in the 200,000 foot range, but the final breakup of the crew module, as they determined here from this infrared camera footage from an Apache helicopter flying over Texas, was that it, the breakup occurred between 148 and 138,000 feet, and, and it was in the you know, Mach 10 range. So that was a low altitude, a lower altitude and a slower speed than we thought. So the question is, what does that uh, portend for future um, escape systems? Well, if you, look, if you look at the early space program, both the Russian and the U.S. had an individualized crew escape system. The Vostok system, which is shown here on, on your left, was used on all six of the Vostok missions and the crew would eject from the capsule and land by parachute. And all Russian cosmonauts are trained as parachutists. But it was interesting that the first flight of our spacecraft, which was the Mercury Redstone, used an individualized crew escape system. They had a capsule system, but they also had as a backup an ability to put an individual parachute on, blow the hatch, and bail out from from the capsule, which I thought was interesting because early test aircraft often have a backup escape system. And of course, for the first four flights of the shuttle, there was an individualized escape system using an ejection seat. They had to do some, uh, some engineering to get past the overhead panels. If you look at that uh, as an escape, uh, an ejection seat, seat, you'd say, well, how do you eject through the panels? And they actually slide back on rails and then go through the roof. But that was only available because they flew two crew in the first four missions. After the Challenger mishap, which broke apart, uh, the, the breakup started at 45,000 feet and a little over Mach 1 and uh, lofted up to 60,000 feet, an entirely survivable breakup. Uh, they came up with an escape system, which was called the Mode 8 uh, bailout, which was controlled gliding flight. But they also had a backup system which was called Mode 9, or a, a, a bailout from a crew module that was broken apart from the shuttle. And that's exactly how 
the Challenger broke up, and as it turns out in the investigation, that's exactly how the Columbia broke apart. The crew module remained intact. The breakup forces initially were survivable for both of those, uh, but in the case of Columbia, because of the higher speed uh, on reentry, um, it eventually was um, something that they were going to, uh, you know, have to uh, contend with. So in 2009, I got involved with this project called Red Bull Stratus. And it's interesting, there's been a number of uh, t attempts throughout the world. Uh, the, probably the one that's come closest is a French uh, test parachutist, Michel Fournier, who following the Hermes uh, bailout uh, capability from that shuttle, wanted to do it personally. And he did f had had four attempts at trying to bail out from a balloon in the stratosphere. But fortunately, with enough dedication and the right team and enough funding, um, we started this program that actually uh, was formulated in 2007. The ideas were put to paper and uh, hardware was developed starting in 2009. Spacesuit was used, uh, which was based on the advanced crew escape suit. And uh, we took that to a flight test program, which included six chamber flights at uh, Beale Air Force Base and, and uh, eight chamber flights at Beale and six uh, thermal vacuum tests with the capsule and the parachute and the spacesuit in, in uh, San Antonio at the Brooks facility uh, in cooperation with the U.S. Air Force. And then two unmanned balloon flights in 2012 and the, uh, in 2013, I mean 2011 and 2012. Um, what, what I was able to bring to the table was my high altitude parachute experience and also uh, supporting military uh, parachute uh, test uh, flights, and also my insight into the uh, advanced crew escape suit that NASA uses. But I also brought to, to, uh, to the table the uh, historic lessons learned from the stratospheric balloon programs. And prior to the space program, we, the US and Russia, both used stratospheric balloons to test their escape systems. The Air Force program was called Excelsior, and they did three high-altitude uh, bailouts. On the first one, Joe Kittinger, who was the test parachutist in all three, uh, got into a flat spin and went unconscious. And on his last jump, his, uh, his glove failed, and he got a, basically exposure to vacuum. Uh, there was also a Navy program that tested the Mark IV pressure suit for the Mercury uh, program. They sustained a landing fatality. The Russians had a program called Volga, which used a capsule mock-up of the Vostok and two test parachutists, and one of those parachutists perished. There was a civilian program in the mid-60s of another uh, 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 test jumper who also died. And then we had the breakup of two SR-71s at Mach 3 and uh, almost 80,000 feet. And we were able to actually interview one of the guys, Bill Weaver, uh, on his uh, insight into that. Uh, and, and review the classified mishap reports. Um, here's Joe Kittinger on his uh, final jump uh, from two, two, 102,000 feet, 800. Almost the, the use of duct tape on his, uh, ch on his seat pack. Uh, and after his flight, his hand swelled up to twice the normal size from the exposure to vacuum. We also extensively debriefed not just not only Joe Kittinger, who was the senior technical advisor for Stratus, but also his physician, uh, shown here on the far left, uh, Dick Chubb, and as well as the physician that was on the other fatality, uh, the, the uh, Stratajump mission that was a civilian program in the U.S. And this is a picture of the Russian Vostok, I mean uh, Volga capsule, which is actually still in a museum in Russia. And they, amazingly, they tested their escape systems with test parachutists, just like the U.S. did. And we had the opportunity to uh, um, look at the capsule, but we never did find anybody we could talk to on that program. But we did talk to the people that were involved in the Soyuz 11 mishap, which was also a, a suit uh, or a, a loss of pressure mishap at high altitude. Um, and then this was the uh, SR-71 uh, breakup, and we have the classified mishap report and the test per, uh, pilot from that, Bill Weaver, talking to him. We also wanted to look at all the threats that we would encounter in a bailout from the uh, upper stratosphere. And the Air Force in uh, the late 50s and early 60s launched 100 balloons from New Mexico. And what you see there is that the base of that are two mannequins, instrumented test dummies, as it were, 
that were dropped. Uh, one was dropped with a drogue chute and the other dropped without. And they found that the drogue chutes helped stabilize from a spin. So we knew that a drogue was a very uh, nice uh, backup system to have. Uh, we couldn't do these tests now, but back in the uh, 60s, the Air Force actually spun test subjects on the centrifuge here to see what were the damage effects from a high-speed spin. And they came up with a, you know, a, a insight into if you spun them uh, with a higher center of rotation, there was less blood that went to the head and less damage that was occurred. So we have the re test reports from this uh, very uh, important test program as well. So having prepared ourselves with all that data, the uh, high altitude stratospheric balloon flights of the U.S. and the Russian program, the um, test parachute uh, drops from the Air Force data, which is also what we were able to obtain, and then the human test data, we came up with a plan for uh, the high altitude drogue, which was our number one uh, concern. And as you'll see at the very end here, that was a, a, an understandable threat. So we originally started with a drogue chute that would come out of the center of the peri uh, of the center of mass, uh, and then we ended up eventually going to a high shoulder mount to reduce the spin blood going a column of blood going to the head. Now I'm really shortening this in the interest of time, but I have literally a, a, a an hours long technical talk that I do to uh, some of the crew escape folks that, that are involved in. Uh, commercial activities that are interested in that. And just last week in Los Angeles, we had a uh, one-day debrief to uh, those companies and NASA and the FAA. Uh, one of the things that we decided to do was to not use the drogue chute uh, intentionally so we could get the fastest speed possible. But we had the drogue available and we used a manual control release and also an automated system. And one of the reasons we wanted to have a manual system on the hand or on the glove was that when Joe Kittinger went into his flat spin, he said his arms were flung out and he couldn't bring his hands back in to pull any uh, um, handles on, on, his, uh, on his parachute harness. So we went with a, ma a system that was a trigger on, his, on the suit itself and also a sensor on the, on the uh, suit at the hand that if it got to a high enough rate a spin rate for a long enough duration, it, no matter what, would fire uh, to protect the jumper. So we had a manual system because it's really important to give the crew as much autonomy and decision making, i.e., I don't like this situation, I'm firing the drogue, but also a backup system if they become incapacitated. So those were some major points there. Our next major threat that we faced were the known threats of exposure to a human in the, the a vacuum of space. And the vacuum of space is defined as the vapor pressure of water at, at body temperature, which is equivalent to 63,000 uh, feet or 20 plus thousand meters. And at, what you see here is a, uh, a, a test uh, pilot in a vacuum chamber holding a beaker of water, and the beaker is spontaneously boiling. And the water makes up 70% of our body, and what happens is there's uh, damage that occurs. In the case of Joe's final jump on Excelsior 3, all he lost was the seal in his glove. He had a partial pressure suit, and, the, and what happened is his hand just swelled up and filled the rest of the glove. But if you had a full pressure suit and you lost the seal, and we ana analyzed all of the mishaps that had seal loss above 60,000 feet, that you would very rapidly succumb to an injury that results in this kind of lung damage that we see here. And not to get too much into the, the biology of it, but this is what normal lung tissue looks like, the alveolar sacs and the blood vessels. And this is lung tissue that's been damaged by exposure to ebulism. It occurred in the Soyuz 11 mishap, it occurred in the Columbia mishap, it occurred in the uh, high altitude parachute fatality in the Volga uh, balloon series. And the interesting thing was in talking to the Soyuz 11 recovery crew is that they said that they still had pulses and they did CPR on them, but they didn't have any advanced uh, technology. And so what we did was we developed a, a, a high frequency ventilator that could be used that would ventilate the lung without damaging it. And that's now become uh, an, a standard of care and uh, one of my students, uh, that was his master's thesis, and that's going to be published uh, on the anniversary of the Columbia mishap next week.
or the end of this week. So let's get to the jump. This is the cool stuff. Uh, we did three uh, manned flights. We did one at 71,000 feet, one at 97, and one at 100 and almost 128,000 feet. An incremental flight test program giving us insight into the uh, free fall. And, and interesting thing is when you free, fa free fall from a, a, a balloon, uh, you get a period of microgravity just like you get in parabolic flight and just like you get in space. And so these three incremental test flights allowed us to get experience with what was it like in a pressure suit uh, in, in, in the microgravity environment. But prior to that time, we had done, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 jumps from 27,000 feet. That would be a low altitude jump for us uh, in a pressure suit and the, uh, get, got insight into the uh, mobility constraints in free fall. This was my medical team. Um, Fortunately, we had, uh, we had 10 physicians that were, worked on this program to cover the different shifts. Four of them were uh, residents, so they were students, and I was really proud to have a large educational component, and a lot of publications will be coming out of this that support the medical literature. Um, many of these have gone on now. This uh, Jen Law, Jennifer Law, she's now a NASA flight surgeon. Sharmi Watkins works for NASA, so does, and Becky Blue is finishing her residency. Uh, and many of the others will be coming out. So I consider education was one of the most, uh, the biggest part of our program. So in October 14th of last year, 2012, 65 years to the day that Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in the X-1, Felix Baumgartner free fell from the edge of space and broke the sound barrier. He reached Mach 1.27. Um, which is an amazing feat for somebody to do without the aid of an aircraft. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, and I'll show you the video. So this was a, this was the, uh, a, a, a digital still camera of his exit. This, was the, this is the picture of the year for National Geographic. It was, it was seen by quite a number of people on the 14th of uh, October. I think it had the largest number of YouTube hits ever. And it's, it, it really fascinated the world. So much so that the UN, uh, the head of the UN asked Felix Baumgartner to be an ambassador for education and science and technology, which I think is a, is a cornerstone of what this meeting is all about. Um, this is a video uh, of Felix at the, uh, on the final jump. Uh, he gives a smart salute. He says something like, you have to go really high to see how small you are. There's a perfect exit, which we practiced using a bungee jump step-offs. And uh, you'll see him in free fall here. Um, I've got a more technical version of this for those who want to see the uh, airspeed, altitude, heart rate, and data. You see him go into that tumble. He's breathing pretty hard, and his heart rate's up pretty high, too, because he's really having to work in the suit. Um, eventually, he, uh, he breaks the sound barrier, uh, and, he's, and he, he's above the speed of sound for 30 seconds. Uh, but unfortunately, as the instability in free fall occurs, because there's no aerodynamic forces, uh, he goes into a spin. First, it's a spin to the right. Then he goes and corrects and goes and, and it reverses, it gets a control reversal, goes into a spin from in the left, and then uh, gets inverted in, in, in a flat spin that reached about close to 60 RPM. Now that was not a terrible spin from a standpoint of damage, but it certainly was very disorienting. And one of the things we were really worried about was if he threw up, you know, had motion sickness in his pressure suit. And I'll, I'll show you another view here, which is three cameras, uh, one a pilot camera on the chest pack and the two leg cameras. Um, so here's the step off from the camera on his chest pack, uh, and you'll see the two leg cameras, one looking down and one looking up, and you get a different perspective of the spin. This has sound, I'm not sure you'll be able to hear it. But that's the wind noise on the microphone. And if anybody is interested in the more technical uh, version, I'll show that on my computer because it shows up a lot more detail. So he um, he breaks the sound barrier at 
um, about 119,000 feet, and uh, he's in. He's super. He's supersonic for tw uh, 30 seconds, and then during that time, he becomes dynamically unstable in all three axes, uh, and then eventually slows back down through the sound barrier, gets enough aerodynamic control that he's able to come out of the spin on his own. Uh, but this was really at the limit of human performance. The take-home lesson from this is, if you're going to bail out from the status here, you probably ought to use a drone in space safety um, and I'd like to dedicate this to the Columbia crew because their legacy will be enduring and improving space safety. Thank you. Thank you, John, very, very much. At the Boker in Al, מושב הבוקר, הנה לי איש יקר, וידיד ותיק של מכון פישר ומשרד המדע בפרט ומדינת ישראל בכלל. משום כך אין צורך להזמין את ראש נאסא, מר צ'רלי בולדן, מר צ'רלי בולדן, מר צ'רלי בולדן, מר צ'רלי בולדן, מר צ'רלי בולדן. Thanks to all of you for uh, the privilege of being here, first of all, and uh, for inviting me to participate um, on behalf of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. It's, um, it's quite a pleasure to be able to come back to Israel and visit with some old friends, and it's an honor for me to take part in this event, which annually commemorates the amazing life of Elan Ramon by fostering discussions among nations around the world many who are represented here today to continue their important work in science, technology research, feels that he so passionately supported. You know, uh, Rona, where are you? There she is. Rona and I had a very brief discussion last night about two Hebrew words. And, uh, and I thought I would recap that discussion because I thought about it last night. And, and as I was listening to the earlier tributes to the crew, as I listened to, to uh, Rona's comments and everything, those two words are l'chaim and shalom. Uh, and um, I know I'll get in trouble here, not being Hebrew, uh, not speaking Hebrew, not being from the country, but, but I spent some time looking them up because um, they mean very special things. Um, and uh, shalom is a word that I would prefer to use today. Uh, L'chaim, to life, to good life, to fun, to everything, but shalom, by my research, is not simply peace, but it's wholeness. Uh, it's completeness. And, um, and, and I, as I think about Alan and the crew of STS-107 and what they brought us, uh, they brought us a certain peace and a certain wholeness even though they are no longer with us here in physical properties on Earth. Uh, another reason I thought about it was because I want to pay a special tribute to a very dear friend. You know, several people have talked about the importance of personal relationships in what we do. Um, I really want to thank, uh, I call him Dr. Rabbi Minister Danny Herskowitz. Uh, he and I have, have known each other now for probably three years or so, and, and I will run the risk of saying in that period of time, a great friendship has grown. Um, and we, he and, uh, and um, Shimona and my wife Jackie and I have lots of conversations that you probably wouldn't, wouldn't believe uh, because you think that two scientists get together and or two technical people, and, and that's all we're going to talk about. And, and we, we frequently talk about technical things, but as a general rule, the conversation 
uh, gets into life and it gets into talk about people because we both firmly believe that that's what we are all about and that's what space exploration is all about. And as I told some students yesterday, uh, as I travel north um, to talk to kids up there, um, you know, I said I could see in them, in each and every one of them, Alain Ramon. I could see him in their faces and uh, in their innocence and exuberance and excitement about what they know they're going to have an opportunity to do. And, and they spoke of hope uh, in, in, this part of the, in, the, in this part of the world that really needs to be reminded that there is hope and that through all adversity, shalom, uh, there is peace, there's wholeness, and, uh, but it only comes when we work at it. It's really hard for me to believe that a decade has passed since the Columbia tragedy. Um, but we continue to strive even harder to fulfill the promise that our brave astronauts have helped us achieve through their hard work and sacrifice. As one who lost friends and colleagues aboard both Challenger and Columbia, I can only say that while time cannot mend the loss, we can honor our brave friends' memory as we are doing here today. By continuing to work together as partners in a global space exploration enterprise. Through their dedication and sacrifice, we are now in a, in a new era of exploration in which humans will reach new destinations such as an asteroid in Mars, and we're transforming the way we reach low Earth orbit. NASA has a long history of international cooperation across a wide variety of space activities. In fact, Cooperation with other nations and groups of nations in the peaceful exploration of space was envisioned as a key element in the legislation that created NASA back in 1958. While we're proud of NASA's global leadership, we're also mindful that the scientific and human spaceflight achievements of the past half century would not have been possible without international cooperation. There is something intrinsically unifying about humankind's exploration of the heavens. Beyond the scientific and economic benefits of launching into space, of literally leaving this planet, I can tell you from firsthand experience that when viewed from orbit, our borderless Earth inspires a sense of humility, unity of humanity, and wonder. As the great British astronomer Sir Fred Hoyle said in 1948, and I quote, once a photograph of the Earth taken from outside is available, a new idea as powerful as any in history will be let loose. How true. This image is uh, an Apollo view of Earth from space. I firmly believe that the original picture of our blue planet from the vantage point of Apollo 8 crew returning to Earth from their trip around the moon forever changed humanity's perspective on our planet and was very possibly the origin of the modern day environmental movement. President Obama has also made space exploration a key element of America's commitment to build a more peaceful world. In his speech at the Kennedy Space Center, Nearly three years ago, he said, and I quote, no longer are we racing against an adversary. In fact, what was once a global competition has long since become a global collaboration, unquote. The astronauts from many countries who have flown on the shuttle and continue today to visit and crew the International Space Station are one of the strongest legacies of the program. Elan Ramon and his colleagues helped forge that model of cooperation that will be the basis of the big enterprises that we will all undertake in the future as people of one planet. I believe that the success of our modern space programs will be judged in part on how well we continue to make space exploration about global partnership, particularly since it is clear that no one nation can do it alone and the benefits to be gained are for all humanity. NASA continues to do research in areas that Alain Ramon studied on his NASA mission, including Earth observations, biological research, and microgravity combustion physics. 
In partnership with other nations, NASA has literally dozens of science missions in development and dozens more in operation. These missions are meeting global science community priorities, leveraging robotic missions to explore the solar system, supporting space-based ob observatories and studying the Earth and monitoring climate change. These include the incredible Hubble Space Telescope that I had the privilege to launch in 1990 and the James Webb Space Telescope proceeding toward its 2018 launch. This view of Earth, very similar to that from the Apollo crew, was taken with the Suomi NPP telescope uh, that orbits Earth today. Much higher resolution gives us a much truer image of our Earth as we see it and uh, gives us a perspective that shows even more the beauty of this planet. We've greatly improved our ability to view Earth in much better detail as this image shows. With NASA's long history of successful international cooperation and more and more nations reliant on space-based capabilities to support their day-to-day -day lives, I have every reason to believe that we will continue to build strong relationships around the world and create a unified effort for expanding humanity's horizons beyond our planet. Whether that means sending astronauts into space, designing experiments, supplying crucial parts on one of our new observatories, or being a researcher who analyzes data from our spacecraft. There can be a role in exploration for everyone who wants to participate. It's a very exciting time to be involved in space exploration. In addition to all the science and research on human health that continues to be conducted on the International Space Station, perhaps its most profound historic achievement is the manner in which it continues to demonstrate that many nations can work together on a project of enormous scope, complete it, and keep it going. Fifteen nations contributed to the development and assembly of the International Space Station, and even more will soon become involved in the program through their utilization of this amazing research facility on orbit. The ISS represents our toehold to the rest of the solar system. What we learn there is going to make it possible for us to venture farther. It will help us become a truly spacefaring people. Already, We've had people continuously on orbit each and every day, each and every hour, each and every second for more than 12 years. Just the thought of this would have been science fiction when I was a kid. Not only is the ISS the largest, most complex international scientific and engineering program in history, it's a test bed for future technologies and systems, and it is a tangible symbol of the unprecedented international cooperation. Just take a look outside on a clear evening or morning and you might see a very bright shining star moving swiftly overhead. That is the International Space Station, the temporary home for international crews living and working in space. I believe that we explore despite the risks because it's part of our human nature and because it draws us together in a global cause that improves life here on Earth. As a result, we share the triumphs and the tragedies together. My hat is off to the brave men and women who continue to line up at our doors to become the next generation of astronauts, scientists, and engineers. Their dedication and commitment to space exploration will in the very near future enable humans to successfully move beyond low Earth orbit to a variety of challenging destinations. While NASA will do everything humanly possible to keep them safe, there will undoubtedly be risks as space remains a hostile environment. However, our research efforts on the ISS, our investments in technology development here on Earth, and our precursor robotic missions will all help make significant contributions to reducing this risk. As we sit here today and reflect on the contributions and the ultimate sacrifice made by Alain Ramon, the rest of the Columbia crew, and other space explorers before them around the world, I know 
that they would be proud of what we have accomplished and what we are planning to do in the future in their names for all humanity. The world that Alan and his crew viewed from onboard Columbia is exemplified by this image of the region of the world in which we are gathered today. From that vantage point, Alan saw his home country and its neighbors in incredible beauty without boundaries in conflict. As was my experience, he probably found himself wondering why we can't do more to bring peace and tranquility among the diverse peoples of the world. Why we can't find ways to cooperate and work toward common goals for the benefit of humanity, as he was doing aboard Columbia, and as our international crews do today aboard the ISS. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for inviting me to join you in this celebration of life and legacy of Alain Ramon, a great explorer and humanitarian, and to the path of exploration and discovery ahead that we'll all travel together into the cosmos. God bless all of you. Shalom. Charlie, as we heard that uh, you fell in love in Hebrew, we prepare for you a, a Bible written both in Hebrew and in English with your name engraved on, it, on its cover. And may God bless you, your family, and all NASA people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now uh, take a 30-minute um, break. I invite you to watch the NASA theater movie, um, uh, The Hall Downstairs, and uh, the marquee will now be um, available for visits from some VIPs who have to leave later, and therefore the rest of you will be able to visit there only later. Thank you for your cooperation, and we are going to resume at 40 past 11. Thank you. <laughs>